Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the uh, last UFC card for the year. Uh, we've had a very good season doing both uh, DFS and uh, and betting. The betting has just ramped up in the last month or so, and that is just a whole ton of fun. And I'm going to do a separate video on that uh, pro probably just after I close this one out. Uh, you'll be able to tell because we'll be wearing the same sweater. Um, nonetheless, uh, I think it's a very instructive card with respect to drafting scoring um, because there's a incredible amount of wrestling upside to be had on this fight, uh, excuse me, on this fight card. And that includes some favorites and some underdogs. And as we've talked about quite often, uh, that's, uh, it's a really important component to doing playing DFS is getting the grappling upside from those fighters who do, do not have a significant, you know, inside the distance problem. So I did a full kind of MMA DFS breakdown in general on my channel with uh, Brett Appley yesterday, who is just awesome. Uh, he, he runs uh, dailyfanmma.com, and we spoke about DFS in general. We spent more time than I thought I was going to on wrestling and grappling upside specifically. Um, we did some work on this card, but not, not in depth. And uh, so this is going to be the... the primary slate breakdown and, and what's good about this is that i've now have the full week of information i have you know i ha even have this last car this last fight that got ruled out i have ownership uh projections and again for those who are not true dfs members i encourage you to join so you have access to my projections my sheets my ownership projections and all that but let's get right to it there are only two fights on the card where the favorite has an inside the distance prop of better than even money. And those are, um, um, where are we? Mikhail Alizaychuk, who his inside the distance prop is minus 115 or something like that. Um, actually a little bit better, like minus 120. And the other one is, is Amir Albazi, who has an inside the distance prop of about, again, minus 120, right? So aside from those two, there's nobody on this card who is favored to finish. And that's pretty rare. There's usually get a couple of big favorites that have that. And in addition to that, you often get these underdogs that maybe are not that likely to win, like maybe two to one underdogs or whatever it is, but when they win their win condition, is 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 a ko um a good amount of the time you don't have too much of that either so it makes for a really challenging card but it was what it does do is really forces you in a good way i guess to to identify the wrestlers because when you don't have a lot of finishing upside and, and you have to model for decisions getting that grappling upside is just so important um so we'll get to that. The first fight of the night is actually kind of interesting because you have Sergey Morozov, who does not have the same type of inside the distance prop as the guys we, I just spoke about. Like he has an inside the distance prop of about, was it plus 200? Maybe even more. Let's see. Uh, Morozov inside the distance is plus 200. But he's got wrestling upside. You know, so he's got the combination of an okay inside the distance prop and the wrestling upside and he is a very similar price to these other guys so so you have morozov for example at 9300 and then you have olazay at 9400 and albazi at 9600 or whatever so while olazay chuck does not exact excuse me but while morozov does not exactly have the same type of inside the distance prop as these guys I, I think that his his wrestling and his path to victory, even in decisions, um, should they come, overcomes that to make him pretty much an even play with at least all his HR. We'll get to Albazi in a minute, but I think that Morozov is, is just as good of a play as all his HR. And the fact that he's the first fight of the night might lead for a little bit of reduced ownership. Remember, you have this late slot business and – mostly the theory with late swap is that you want to push stuff back as much as possible. And I haven't done a lot of homework to see where the ownership is, has come what's happened since late swap is 
been out there. But I would like to imagine that ownership will be lower on these on these earlier fights. I'm currently seeing a pretty consistent ownership projection of 23% on Morozov. Um, but compare that to Ola Zaychuk, who I see of like a 33% ownership projection. And that's a pretty significant discount. So um, I don't know whether it's because they think Ola Zaychuk is a much better play or because it's later. But nonetheless, I'm getting uh, getting a little bit of reduced ownership on Morozov. And I think it makes it a pretty good tournament play. Um on the other side, Newsom, I just don't see it. You know, when whenever you have these these guys that are plus three to one, you know what I mean? It's, it's really not a lot of winning chances relative to these prices. To play these guys that are three to one underdogs, you really need one of a couple of things. Right? No, number one, maybe wrestling upside uh, because number one in your in your decision wins at sixty nine hundred. You know, if you get a win by wrestling, it's going to score enough to make the optimal. The other thing, which is kind of sneaky, is that if you're a good enough wrestler at 6,900, but maybe not good enough to win, you might get enough takedowns and enough points to 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 get to the optimal with a loss. And the, I think the last two fight cards have shown that, uh, that, that example. We had uh, Jared Gordon, actually wasn't particularly wrestling, but it was more control time, whatever. He scored a decent amount in a loss that got the optimal on a really high scoring card, actually. And then actually it could have been higher. And then you had Natividad, who a couple of weeks before that, I believe, uh, in a loss, he got there as well in the optimal with the same guy that he was fighting. So um aside from that, though, these 6,900 fighters, they just don't win often enough. I guess that's the best way to describe it to just win to, to to be rosterable absent some you know particular situation with their style the other time you could play a 6900 hour fighter even though his win his win odds aren't great is when his opponent has just an incredible amount of ownership because you get leverage in that way um and unfortunately morozov is not going to be particularly high owned so i think newsom is is basically an outright fade so first fight, I think Morozov's a very, very sharp uh, tournament play, kind of right off the bat. Next fight, you have Kopp against Dvorak. And I was talking with, about this with Brett yesterday. I think Kopp is the same play as Ozechuk. And when I say the same, I don't mean as good, but I think it's a, a very easily projectable play. What I mean is he doesn't have any wrestling upside. It's not going to be a particularly high-volume affair so it really comes down to what his inside the distance prop is to see whether he's a good play or not so you look at it and you have where are we um we have his inside the distance prop is about where is it Pop inside the distance, plus 170 or so. Now you see what I'm doing, by the way. I'm just basically cutting, you know, the middle of this big here. So plus 170, which is, I mean, not great. It's not It's not the worst. It's a, He's probably a little bit overpriced for this at 9,100. That inside the distance prop is probably closer to 8,900 or 9K. But the point of it is, is that I think that, this is going to be projected efficiently, right? I mean, everybody that runs these projections is just going to, there's really no room for for anybody to be really wrong on this one. You know, you put the inside the distance prop in as a function of their, of their, of their price. And then you get, and, and you get a projection. And when I look at my projections, it's pretty consistent across the board, you know, where he's going to come out. So what that means is that his ownership is probably it's supposed to be, pretty efficient. So I I would say that you're not going to beat anybody by playing someone like Manel Cobb. I mean, he's going to be 25% owned. Um, well, that's what I'm looking at right now, about 25%. And you compare that to Ola Zaychuk, And again, Ola Zaychuk is a little bit of a better play because his inside the distance prop is better. And we'll get back. Maybe we'll get back to him in a, in a minute. His inside the distance prop is better, yet he is more expensive. So, you know, depending on what else you can get on the slate, I suppose, that's where the ownership is going to factor in. But the point is, is that you're not going to you're not going to out project the field on, 
either of those two guys. You just have two guys that are going to either KO or not, right? Um, and neither of their opponents are particularly going to be uh, particularly high owned. Actually, we'll, we'll get to Olaze Chuck in a minute because Olaze Chuck's opponent, Corey Brundage, might actually get burner some ownership. Um, so I think that Cop is probably even a worse play for that reason because Cop's opponent, um, Dvorak, nobody's going to play. I mean, Dvorak has, has no wrestling upside. He has no, you know, KO upside. He's, he's, he's a good fighter, but his, his win condition is a decision. So no one's really going to be playing him, which means that cop is not that great of a play. Um, so I guess that's, that's my summary. I like if cop is going to show up as I would say a break even play over the course of time. And when you play break even plays over the course of time, it's not really the way you win GP PP. So what I would say is that if you're hand building, I would play cop only in lineups where you can play something kooky in other parts of your line. If that makes any sense. Um, we'll get to the Saberson built in a minute because Saberson actually does a pretty good job of, of generating kookiness when you don't have any need to do so. Um, we'll get to that in a bit. So you have battle against uh, Fakwadinov, and this is one of, of, of several um, grap well, grap well, let's say grappler versus striker matchups, but let's just say that one guy is the much better grappler, or at least looks like the much better, better grappler than the other. So when, when you have a fight like this, look, you start with the inside the distance prop, which I promise you is going to be poor. Um, well, because I've seen it. You have battle inside the distance is like atrocious, plus 500. You have Fakwadinov inside the distance, which is a little better at plus 270, but it's still not great. I mean, not even remotely great, but, you know, Fakwadinov has the grappling upside. Okay, so um, of anybody in this fight, I would I would take Fak Medinov and you're going to start building this kind of wrestling, this wrestling pool. Right. So, so, so Fak Medinov is certainly the play. The only way I would not do this, the only way maybe I would play battle is if it looked like Fak Medinov is going to be high owned. And again, it depends on the way the slate breaks down with respect to whether guys are going to be high owned. In other words, if you need these eight K's then a guy with wrestling upside is just going to get pounded. Um, so let's just take a look at it. In my ownership projections, I do have Fakradinov at 30% ownership. So in this particular case, um, you know, in deep GPPs, battle would actually show up as the pre pretty decent leverage here. Um, and likewise, you know, Fakradinov at 30% ownership, look, and look, it's a good play theoretically, Right, you you have a guy with an okay inside distance prop with 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 good wrestling upside, but a thirty two percent ownership. I would say this that again, if you're going to play him, I would play him with guys that are a little bit kind of kind of bizarre. Um, and we'll we'll get to maybe some examples of that a little little bit later. Um, we'll we'll compare this actually to the next fight on the board here. So so the next fight you have Garcia against. Uh, We'll pull this up here against Mahashate. And it looks like a very similar thing, right? You have Garcia is minus about a you know a little about a similar type favorite. You have the price is pretty much the same, right? Uh 84 versus 78. Rafael Garcia's upside is is completely based on not completely, but mostly based on his ability to grapple, which is good for DraftKings scoring. But the only difference is, is that I'm looking at ownership projections and I see Garcia at only 20 percent, um, where Fak Medinov is at 32. Now, why is that, by the way? Why would you think that that, that Fak Medinov, um would be 32 percent and Garcia would be 20, considering that they have the same kind of win condition? They're pretty much the same price, pretty much the same odds. The best I could say is that. The hundred that you save from going to Garcia to Fakradinov, I bet if you run a lot of optimals, you'll see that a lot of lineups are max out at 50K. And when lineups match at max out at 50K, what that usually means is there is a there is a difference between that hundred. Like that hundred that you could spend on uh that you'd have to spend on Garcia might might cost you maybe getting to Albazi or some other guys that you might want to get to. So that's why in a situation like that, 
you could get lower ownership. So what I like to do is is accept the lower owned guy and just just not not let the optimizer just dictate my construction. You know what I mean? Like I, I will if if I need to play a 33% owned factor Dinoff, for example, to get to Albazi, I'd rather just not play Albazi. You know what I mean? Because can be high owned also, but we'll get to that. But I would rather take the lower owned Garcia, pair him with something lower owned, and and just kind of get and and, and kind of move onward. Um so I actually do like the 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 Garcia side a lot. And because, like I said, because Garcia rates to be lower owned, um, I don't think the Mahachete uh is a particularly uh is a particularly good play. Um it, it's a shame because I think Mahachete, if he were battle, if that makes any sense, I could play Mahachete as leverage against a really high owned uh Fakwadinov. But battle doesn't really have that inside the distance prop that maybe Mahachete does. Let's look at that. Um, see, Mahachete is inside the distance prop. I imagine it's pretty good because it just got a KO um, in the first round. Mahachete inside the distance is pretty reasonable, like plus 280 as opposed to battle, which is like plus 270, uh, 500 or whatever. But because he's in the fight, which is less owned, um, you don't really, he doesn't really carry with him that type of, that type of leverage. So um, I'm probably not going to play too much of Machete, if at all. I'll probably, maybe I'll get some, but even he's 25% owned. I mean, he's no bargain either. You know, I got one ownership projection, a projection of 37. I don't think that's accurate. Um, the others are much more close. They're closer to about 25, which, which makes more sense to me. Okay. Um Moving on, we have the Battle of the Saeeds. The Saeed uh, Kakramanov and Saeed Nurmagomedov. And here's another one. You know, you have, despite the fact that you have Nurmagomedov, uh, the name, the, the the actual true wrestling upside guy here appears to be Kakramanov. Um, look, if you look at the inside the distance props, so again, let's, let's just kind of do what we do. Um Fight doesn't go to decision is actually better than I thought. But you have Nurmagomedov inside the distance is, is plus 300, which is pretty pretty poor for this price. Kakramanov inside the distance, again, plus 350, kind of poor at this price. But you do have the wrestling upside for Kakramanov. I, I have, again, I ha just have a feeling that this fight is just going to bust. Um, I it, I mean, I've talked about this with Brett a little bit and I'm trying to gather the information and it just feels like it's going to be more of a clinch fest that, that Nurmagomedov is, 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 you know, is savvy enough to stay away from all the takedowns. And if we can, if, if Kakramanov's going to be high owned, it's probably someone I want to like to fade but I'm looking at the ownership, and it's not that bad. It's like 23 24%. Both of these guys actually are owned very similarly. So I don't know exactly what I want to do with this fight. But but I, I do I will say this, that I do prefer the Kakramanov side because – hold on. <laughs> I do prefer the Kakramanov side just from – because there's no leverage on the other side. You know what I mean? Like if – if Kakramanov's like 30%, I would say play Nurmagomedov to get that leverage. Because I think it's close enough where maybe Nurmagomedov could get a, uh, a submission or something like that. But of, in, in the absence of that, I still I do think that Kakramanov is the right DFS side here. I don't think the ownership is enough to keep me off of him. Um, I'm not going to make him a priority again just because from all I've been hearing about this fight thing, I, I, this fight, I think it, I think it might not be as wild a you know a Kakramana takedown episode you know uh exhibition as as some people might think so um probably kind of an instinctive fade but for the purposes of instruction I, I think Akramanov is probably the side. All right Jake Matthews against Matthew Semmelsberger. So here's another ninety one hundred dollar fighter with with uh with uh with grappling upside. Um he didn't show in his last fight but he definitely has it in him. So we'll take a look at Matthew's inside his inside the distance prop and it's not bad. 
you know, it's, it's, it's minus 200, um, excuse me, plus 200, plus 200 plus wrestling upside sounds a lot like the more, the, the Morozov play, you know? Um, so I, I do regard the Matthews play as very similar here. Um, let me take a look and see if Semmelsberger has any kind of, of even if it's plus 300 to, to, to finish, I might consider it. Let's take a look. Semmelsberger inside the distance. No, it's terrible. So for me, it's either Matthews or nothing here. Well, let's take a look at the Matthews um, ownership. It's reasonable enough, you know, at 21%. I mean, it's the same as Morozov. I mean, I think I think the two of them are both very fair. Um uh, yeah, I I think I think they're I think that it's it's I think it's fair enough. Well, where where is all this machete machete ownership coming from? I, I honestly don't know. Um, all right. Let's uh let's move on. Corey McKenna versus Cheyenne Blissmith. This, this to me is is just is just easy. I mean, you have Corey McKenna, whose entire path to victory is based on wrestling, and you know Cheyenne Blissmith. A couple of fights ago, she got there's there's some red flags. I mean, a couple of fights ago, she she was a minus five hundred favorite or four hundred favorite against. Um, we get the exact odds here, so we can actually do this against uh oh it's gone already she was you have to trust me a, a minus 400 favorite a few fights ago and someone who literally had one grappling move and and cheyenne knew that she was gonna go for this and she couldn't stop it anyway really just atrocious look at minus 400 then she came back with incredible motivation uh listen go watch the youtube videos of what happened to her after this fight um she came back and basically saved her life and her career with a big KO win and a 50 K fight of the night bonus. Um, and now she, then she went and fought Mallory Martin, who was, you know, a pretty supposedly a pretty good wrestler and bullied her around a little bit. I didn't like something that she said in the interviews leading up to this fight. She was basically saying that, listen, I, you know, if you, if you want to have a boring fight, like take them down. Like, what are you doing here? You know, like, Mallory Martin, I was like talk trash talking to her, like, what are you doing over takedowns? We're here to we're here to entertain, you know, whatever. This type of talk just sounds like someone who just really doesn't want to deal with, with grapplers, really what didn't want to deal with wrestlers. And as a as a as a 300 favorite or wherever she is now, or 9100 fighter, I I think, I think, I think this is just a just a, a clear Corey McKenna spot. Um is she gonna win? No, probably not. She's like a two to one underdog. That's the way it goes, but your entire win condition is in in, in the a form of, of an MMA that scores really well. And she's only 19% owned. You know, I, I think that she's a, a kind of an elite underdog type play in DFS. Is she gonna win? I don't know. Probably not, but when she does, you're you're really in business. So I think it's just just clearly the side here. Um and uh, as listen, as much as I respect Bliss Miss, I again watch these YouTube videos on her, or whatever. Just don't think this is the spot at nine k. She's and I, I thought she was going to really low owned. I would say whatever. I don't even think she's going to be low owned. I mean, she has like a big one hundred forty point results a couple of fights ago, and you know, at twenty percent ownership, I think it's it's fair. I mean, you know, I, I don't think it's particularly high owned. So uh, low owned, I don't think you get much leverage there in that way. So I don't know. Uh, for me, it's it's kind of a clear, pure DFS type play to play Corey McKenna. Um, okay, uh, Duran Wynn, Hui Marquez is out. Cody Brundage against uh, Olazechek. We talked about the Olazechek side before. Um, very logical play, good inside the distance prop at his price. You probably want a little bit better. You know, at 9,400, you'd like to have not only the first round KO upside or the KO upside, but you would sort of like to have wrestling upside also. You're not getting that. So it's not like a smash play or anything. So as a result, it's not going to be like 40% owned or anything like that. You know, it, it's probably going to be about 30, 35. I still think that might be a little bit, little, little frothy. 
of an ownership. Um, again, for that price, you'd want to have a little bit more than that. So I think he's okay. But again, likewise, I would only put him with, with lower owned fighters I, I, in the big GPPs. I, I think that's very, really reasonable. Um, okay, so so Bobby Green and Drew Dober, this is like one of those weird fights that just kind of breaks the slate sometimes. Um, you have neither guy with a good inside the distance prop. You have Bobby Green like, like plus two, plus 800. You have Dober is like plus 200, you know, which is significantly better, you know. And people really don't play fights like this, you know, with strikers and, and all this stuff. Um, the problem here is that, again, I'm seeing ownership just pretty freaking smooth here. I'm getting Dober at 22%, 24%. So, I mean, it's not bad, um, but again, it's not great. So this is not one of those kind of low own, you know, lower own guys um, that, that, that I kind of described. Um, this is going to be an interesting card because ownership is pretty spread out. You're not, you only have a couple of guys that are going to be really high owned. And those are obviously going to be huge fades. I'm going to get to that in a minute. Um, but aside from that, I mean, these, these, all these 20% guys, you just kind of play them, you know, because as long as you don't, I think you should be a stick. I don't think you should play the 33% guys. I think this always a Chuck play might be kind of a lemon at this ownership, you know? And who is the other guy I talked about? Um, I think Cop. Actually, Cop's just kind of okay. Um, we'll get we'll get we'll get to some really bad not bad chalk. Whatever. We'll get to some chalk that I think you can fade in a minute. Okay, Arosa versus um, uh, Caceres. Arosa is coming off a really good performance as an underdog. Um, his inside the distance prop is not the best, it's plus 260. He has like okay wrestling. I don't know if that's the way he's going to go here. I mean, Caceres does have submissions, but then again, I think Arosa is kind of a madman. I think he'll just kind of, he won't care. So I think Arosa definitely has some decent combination of, of that okay inside the distance prop with some wrestling upside to kind of do that, um, to make that work. He does have some some recency bias going against him. We'll talk about that during the betting breakdown. And again, another 22, 23% dude who who is going to make sense. Uh Caceres on the other side, uh, his his inside the distance prop is is, I believe, poor. Plus 600. That's just not gonna work, you know. Um, especially without the wrestling upside. So for me, uh, he's gonna be kind of a fade. All right, so here's 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 the big deal. So um, Amir Al Bazi, he's plus ninety six hundred. He's ninety six hundred. So what do you need from ninety six hundred? Ninety six hundred, you need it all. You know, you need a, you need either, probably both. I, you, you could argue that a first round KO at ninety six hundred is not even enough. Like you need to either have the KO in the first minute, or a submission in the first round that was predicated by multiple knockdowns or multiple takedowns or a takedown followed by like the whole round of control time and round event. Okay. The other way you can get 9,600 is in the second round. If you just take the guy down a million times, you know, and control him again for two rounds and ground and pound it, you know, that's what you need to get there at 9,600. And I don't know. I was talking to Brett about this yesterday and at this weight class as well. I mean, I don't know if this is really in the cards for him. Look, they're, they're feeding him somebody that they, he can be, you know, cause they like him and he probably wins and he probably gets the submission eventually, whatever. But if I'm seeing 35% ownership, at 35% ownership, you know, at 9,600, I mean, I, I don't think I can do it. Um, and, and it's funny. If I wanted to play him, literally the rest of my lineups would have to be just off the wall. And there aren't that many, like, even great off-the-wall plays, you know? Like, if let's let's just say I wanted to just blindly fade the the, the, the high-owned other guys, like the um, – 
I didn't talk about Brundage. Yeah, I got to talk about Brundage. Sorry about that. Um, so I want to talk about Brundage because he is a guy that I play alongside of Albazi. I don't know why I forgot about him. So we talked about the Alizé play, right? So Brundage on the other side, this this is someone that I think you have to play. I mean, I, 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 he's he's not likely to win. He's about three to one to win, I guess. Let's take a look at this actual odds here. Not even not that bad. It's like plus two fifty to win. He wins it thirty percent of the time, and every I don't want to say every time, but almost every time he wins this fight, he's in the up. You know, he is a wrestler, and he's not going to beat what's his name just out striking him and KOing him. He's going to beat him by grinding him out, surviving the first round, getting takedowns, and then just controlling him and getting a decision. And he'll get ninety maybe in a situation like that. Or 80. So him, I see him in 15% ownership. I mean, th this is the guy, unfortunately, that I'm referring to when I said in earlier fights that only play him with lower owned guys. This is the guy you have to play with the chalk, I think. You know, between Brundage and McKenna, like those are the, 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 the punts that you have to play with these, you know, with, with these kind of popular fighters. So that, that would, so that takes care of Brundage, and it also takes care of Albazi. Uh, Costa on the other side. So again, what were what were my my uh, my criteria for betting on these sixty nine hundred guys? Number one is listen, they're not going to have good win odds, so they better either primarily a combination of, of these three things have KO upside in their wins, um, wrestling upside in their wins, or Extreme leverage in their wins. Well, I will say this about the Costa side. He certainly has extreme leverage in his wins. I mean, you have Arbazi, who's going to be the second most owned fighter. We'll get to the most owned in a minute. Um, and I don't exactly know how Costa would win. Um, I heard some takes that he's got a lot of power in his hands. I heard some takes that he might have some wrestling. I, I don't know. I really have no idea. But the combination of the leverage plus the fact that, I mean, it's not like nobody thinks he's going to win. Um, uh, he wins this fight, Costa, how much? I mean, not often. He's actually plus 360, so that's only about 22% of the time, maybe. Yikes. Um, so it's a rough one. <laughs> um it's a rough one. I might sprinkle him just in case, just because of the leverage. But it's definitely, listen, it's definitely not as good of a play as Brundage. How about that? I'll say that. All right. So uh, we have two more fights to go. We have Armand Sarukian against Amir Ismagulov. And this fight, you have a very poor inside the distance prop on both sides. You have Saruki inside the distance is plus 320 at only 8,900. That's pretty bad. Or 8,800, whatever he is. May as well take a look at it. Sorry about that. Didn't mean to put it that way. Yeah, he's 8,900. So certainly can't bet him on that. And he does have some takedown upside. Um, is it enough? I mean, from what I've gather and from what I've read and whatever, I mean, Duzma Gulov is kind of tough to take down and it's just kind of tough in general. I, I don't know if, if, if Saruki can get there at 8,900. The, the other, I mean, I was talking about this with Brett yesterday. I was trying to talk myself into this, actually. Um, and in the end, maybe I maybe I will sprinkle some some Saruki. Uh, I'll tell you I don't want to play. I don't want to play Isma Gulov. And the reason why is again, Sarukian is get another twenty two percent guy. That's it. Is not overly chalked, not overly under under owned. So if you play Demir. I mean, he's not getting any leverage on anybody. And the problem here is, unfortunately, it just looks like all of his wins don't get there. Um, this 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 one really bothered me as well. I don't know why this fight bothers me so much from a DFS perspective. Because this is what happens. Oh, I, I I know what's going to happen. But. So you look at this whole game log. It's like decision, 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 decision. Even in wins, he's not scoring all that great. Uh, he's got a 64. He's got a 56 in a win. 
Um, I, that's not going to work. And he, I don't think he's really getting takedowns against Sarukian, so he can get, get these. It's kind of it's hard enough to win, but to win and then not cash also, it's tough. Um, so I'm probably going to do what most people, sharp people do, and probably fade this fight. Um, depends how many lineups I play. Uh, probably maybe I'll get sprinkles, whatever. But they're definitely neither of them are, are good plays. So now we get to Strickland against Cannoneer. So the problem here is this: first of all, it's a five round fight. Um, but you have a pick 'em odd. Uh, it's a pick 'em fight, but Cannoneer is priced as if he's a plus one thirty, you know, or one forty. It's it's Strickland is eighty five hundred and Cannoneer seventy seven hundred. So as a result, the combination of five rounds plus the, you know, plus the the line value makes Cannoneer sort of a theoretical lock at seventy seven hundred, right? Um. In addition to that, he does have some KO upside. Like if you look at the, um, if you look at the inside the distance property, have your Cannoneer by TKO is plus only it's plus three hundred, um, and that's not bad. I mean, it's not great. Cannoneer inside the distance plus two forty. I mean, at that price, seventy seven hundred. That's not bad. And considering also you have five rounds to rack up strikes and the line value, I mean, from a from a math perspective, this is sort of a lock. Um, however, I imagine, especially with win out, because Deron Wynn was going to be another underdog that you could play, I think that Cannoneer is going to be 50%. Um, I, I haven't projected at 40 I think it could be higher because of everything that I just said. And in, in cash, I, I think you play him. I think in cash, you might even want to stack this main event. If you want to know the truth. Um, but I don't play cash, so who cares? Um, I just don't feel as though you're supposed to play this at 40%. Um, I, I, would, I would say this, same as this, these other charms. I, I would only play him with with low owned guys, um, and we'll do a, a Saberson build to accomplish this because it, you got to really have some vision with some of these guys. Like I, I think you might end up having to play someone like Semmelsberger, you know, or even Costa, maybe even um, well, like Journey Newsom is so oh god, how can you play that? And, but that's what you have to play. I mean, that's just what you're going to have to play uh, uh, to get to these these. Uh, Jared Cannoneers. Um, it's just way too much ownership you're eating. Um, then on the other side, you have Strickland. And Strickland, oh, we'll say the same thing we did last last fight he had. I mean, it's good. Does have wrestling upside if he chooses to go there. Um, will he go there? I don't know. Maybe. Probably not. Uh, if he wouldn't, wouldn't go to wrestling against Pereira. I don't know why we do it here, but I don't know. Maybe, maybe he will. Maybe, maybe he's going to look like an amazing play at 8,500. After the fact, when he actually goes for five rounds of takedowns and scores 120. And I, I do think that because of the ownership on Cannoneer, I think that from a GPP perspective, I do think that Strickland is the side, even though, you know, from a math perspective, it just doesn't pan out. I mean, look, from the other side of the, you know, look at the other side of this, like Strickland's a pick and he's being priced as if he's minus 140. You're not supposed to play guys like that, but. Because of the leverage you'll get against Cavanier, I think Strickland is the side in, in this in this main event. Um, okay, hopefully that helps. Um, and ooh, you know what? I forgot to do it. Let's let's do a Saberson build just to see what we would get here. And I'm going to use the projections that I have now, just as kind of an idea. And if I built 150 lineups, what they would look like and what the percentages would be. And I think you're going to be surprised. I think, I think you'll probably get more Costa than you thought. I think you'd be getting more of these, uh, uh, more of these like journey Newsoms than you thought. And the reason why is again, because Sabres is really good at figuring out what type of baloney you're supposed to put with your high owned guys. And it'll, it'll, it'll do what your brain is unable to do and make those lineups. So here we actually have Renat as the highest owned guy. But see, check this out. You got 28% Caceres. 
okay, like that. And you get 27% Bobby Green with the atrocious inside the distance prop. Um, you're getting, well, 8% Kosa. It's not as much. So the Brian Battle, only 3%. Wow. Dvorak, only 8 Semmelsberger, only 9 But you're getting a full 10% of, of Journey Newsom, you know. Um, and, again, this is the surprising one is up here where you'd be getting a full, um, well, you're getting a decent amount of Shepard. The bot, the twenty-seven percent Bobby Green. I mean, that's going to be way ahead of the field. I think. You know, I think he's going to be at most twenty percent. I think that's going to be a, a, a that's going to be a, a cool. It's a cool GPP play because it looks so hopeless. Um, and Caceres at seventy-four hundred. I think that looks pretty. I think that one looks pretty cool. You know, uh, he might be a little less than 20%. You know, then that's what that's all we're talking about with low owned guys in a slate like this is if you're under 20, you're low. If you're over 30, you're high. Everything else, you're just kind of the same. Um, so if you went with the Saberson build, you'd get like all kinds of 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 uh of Fakradinov. Um and then you could obviously change it, do whatever you want, pare down your exposure to things like that. But I do like that Co the Cannoneer is not jammed as much as I thought he was going to be. Um, it would get me with the field at 40%. There's, I have to tell me, there's no, there's no way in the world that I'm playing 40% of Ken. Um, I will, but it's interesting. They do have Strickland. Well, cause I'm getting a weird project projection. I'm getting a higher projection for Strickland than Cannoneer. I have to look into that a little bit. Anyway, um, that'll do it. Good luck. And we're going to follow it up with a betting breakdown in a little bit, which is a lot of fun. Good luck.